Thanks for everyone for uh, coming out. So um, our, our topic today is uh, the December tax legislation, sometimes called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, sometimes not. They actually did not manage to get that title into the legislation. It got struck at the last moment. Uh, in any case, this legislation, whatever its name, is among the most consequential pieces of domestic legislation passed in the last several decades. It will have significant effects on the ways in which business is done in the country, on government finances, on the, and on the distribution of resources. This is not to mention the effects on tax practice, where this is producing an unending amount of work, and that does not seem to likely to end anytime soon. The panel today will discuss a number of key elements and engage in hopefully some uh, discussion around uh, a few of the key parts of this bill. So, in this case, I'm going with the idea that we, we need no introduction, though maybe just a tiny one. Uh, so all of us, uh, so Lily Batzolder, Mitchell Kane, Dan Shaviro, though apparently he needed an introduction to the person writing the <laughs> label on his card. Uh, we when, are I, all, when I've been here longer, I'm hoping they'll get my name right. <laughs> yeah, you know, just a few more years, Dan. Um, so all of us are tax professors here. All of us have worked extensively uh, on this bill from the outside. Uh, none of us were inside. Um, we all co-authored a major report on the bill as it was being drafted, that report focusing on the tax games that would likely be played, and a number of us wrote in other forums on the tax bills it was being written. Um, so with that uh, as, our, as our topper, um, I thought we would now begin to work through some of the sort of key topics, and we've sort of divided up a little bit among some of the key topics, and so starting first with Lily. Great. Um, well, glad to see so many people out today uh, to hear about tax. And um, what I thought I would do is provide a quick overview of the revenue and distributional impacts of the bill and also a very, very quick overview of the individual income tax provisions in it. Um, and then I think uh, Dan's going to talk more about the uh, partnership and uh, corporate. David's going to talk about some of the games being played. And Mitchell's going to talk about more about international. Um, so, so overall, the bill was estimated by the Joint Committee on Taxation, which is the official uh, nonpartisan scorekeeper of tax legislation. They're like the CBO for all spending legislation. Um, they estimated that the bill would cost $1.5 trillion over 10 years, or $1.8 trillion if you include interest costs. Um, and if you, we have a few slides, and then generally we're not going to use slides. Um, but this chart shows that if you look over the first 10 years, generally the tax cuts are split among individuals, uh, estate tax cuts, the new pass-through deduction, and corporate rate cuts. Um, but by the end of the budget period, starting in 2026, this really changes because almost all of the individual tax cuts expire, whereas the other provisions are made permanent. Um, so by the end of the budget window, it's really a big permanent cut to business taxes financed by a tax increase on individuals. Um, if these individual tax cuts are extended, which seems possible, um, then the cost of the bill would go up to uh, over $2 trillion. Um, it is estimated to modestly increase growth in the short term, um, which JCT estimates would reduce its cost by about $400 billion, so um, down to maybe $1.1 trillion, assuming that all of these individual tax cuts do expire. Um, but those long-term growth effects largely disappear and may reverse in the long term because the extent to which it increased deficits means that interest rates are li likely to rise, which will depress investment. Um, it also does not take into account, these JCT growth estimates do not take into account the effect on growth of eventually uh, paying for these tax cuts. So there's no free lunch. Eventually, these will have to be paid for, either through tax increases or spending cuts. And those aren't taken into account in the reported estimates uh, by JCT of the growth effects. So overall, the bill is um, uh, quite regressive. Um, uh, David Kamen has written a great paper on the way that you should measure progressivity as, as a percentage change in after-tax income. And after he wrote that paper, I became a true believer in that and will only generally, uh, if it is available, uh, talk about numbers that are about the percent change in after-tax income. So this shows the near-term effect uh, in 2019. And the tax cuts uh, for 
millionaires uh, are about three times as large as a share of income as a family earning, say, forty to fifty thousand dollars per year. Um, it's even more regressive by the end of the budget window. Um, so at that point, all income groups earning less than seventy-five thousand dollars um, actually face a tax increase. This is after all of those individual tax cuts expire, but there are a few permanent provisions that I'll talk about that result in them paying higher taxes. And I should note that these estimates assume that 25% of the corporate tax cuts um, redound to the benefit of labor. Um, so these don't actually reflect changes in people's personal tax bills. Uh, they also don't include the estate tax. Uh, they don't include uh, changes in spending attributable to the repeal of the individual mandate. And so if you accounted for all those uh, things, uh, the effects would be even more aggressive. Regressive. So um, I now have this slide which violates my general maxim that I will only show distributional estimates as a percent change of after-tax income because uh, the way JCT did these estimates, it wasn't possible to calculate that. So these are just in dollar terms. Um, but they look at what is the effect of the non-business provisions alone. So it's sort of a um, way of thinking about what is the change going to be on individual employees' own tax bills as opposed to the possibility that maybe their business that they work for will give them a wage increase over time. And so if you look just at this, the average tax cut is about $1,000 uh, in 2019. Um, but it becomes an average tax increase of $300 uh, by the end of the budget window. And again, partially because these are presented in dollar terms, you can see that the tax cuts initially uh, really redound more to higher income people. Um, these estimates also, uh, like those macro estimates that I mentioned, don't take account for how this bill will be paid for ultimately. And we don't know, a good guess might be that uh, they might be paid for by either tax increases or spending cuts that are proportionate to income. Um, and that would make these effects look even more regressive over time. So I want to now do the briefest of tours of uh, the individual provisions that are in the bill. Um, so there are only two provisions that are permanent. Um, the first one is a slower measure of inflation in the tax code. Uh, and this actually has really broad effects. It sounds super technical. Um, but it basically means that over time, more income falls into higher tax brackets than it would have under prior law because those tax brackets, income thresholds, uh, grow more slowly because there's this slower inflation measure used. And so this tends to disproportionately affect low and middle income households because the wealthiest are all, most of their income is already in the top tax bracket. So they don't care whether the threshold for it is growing a little more slowly over time. Um, it also reduces the value of a bunch of tax expenditures. So some tax expenditures have components that are inflation indexed and others don't. Um, but for example, the earned income tax credit, which uh, many of you may have heard about, it's essentially a wage subsidy for low income families, primarily who have kids. And the thresholds and all of that are inflation indexed and because they're gonna grow over sl more slowly over time, that means it'll be less worth less compared to current law over time um, than, uh, than it is today um, or would be in the future. Uh, so this provision raises about $133 billion um, in the first 10 years, but its uh, impacts grow really rapidly. So according to the JCT, it raises three times as much in the second decade as the first. Um, so this is one kind of stealth tax increase embedded in the bill that primarily affects low and middle income families. Um, the second uh, and permanent provision, and the only other permanent provision for individuals, is repeal of the individual mandate uh, that's part of health care reform. Uh, technically doesn't repeal the mandate, but it lowers the penalty to zero. So there's no you know, uh, repercussions if you don't uh, purchase health insurance, uh, other than not having it. Um, this raises $314 billion. Um, and CBO estimates that by the end of the decade, it's going to increase the number of uninsured people by 13 million, and it's also going to increase premiums in the individual market uh, by 10%. Um, about half of this uh, is actually due to people buying less insurance on the exchanges, and half due to people not taking up Medicaid benefits to which they're entitled. Very little of it, less than 10% is people not paying that 
tax that used to apply if you didn't uh, purchase health insurance. So all the rest of the individual provisions, uh, including the pass-through deduction that Dan's going to talk about, expire after eight years, at the end of 2025. Um, and this sets us up for a giant fiscal cliff, uh, similar to what we had a few years ago, big extenders debate. Um, there are uh, lots of changes in the individual tax brackets. So uh, this chart shows the top one is if you're married filing jointly, the very top bar shows what your rate is under current law or prior law, and uh, the bottom shows what your rate is under the new law. And it's always lower uh, for married couples. It's not always if lower if you're single. Um, but the cuts are bigger if you earn uh, over about $450,000. Um, there are a lot of changes for non-itemizers. Um, the standard deductions increased, personal exemptions are repealed, um, there is an increase in the child tax credit. Um, the net effect of these is kind of a wash. It's um, close to zero revenue effect if you add all of these uh, provisions together. Um, but it gradually becomes worse for families over time because of that inflation indexing provision. And um, the personal exemptions that were repealed were inflation indexed while the child tax credit is not. Um, so the last uh, major thing I wanted to talk about was there are a lot of changes to itemized deductions. Um, so prior to this bill, about 30% of taxpayers itemized, and afterwards about 10% of taxpayers are going to itemize. Um, part of this is because the state and local tax deduction, which David's going to talk about, is substantially reduced. Um, the mortgage interest deduction is capped at $750,000 if you buy a new home. Um, and there are a bunch of other changes. Um, but the result of having much fewer itemizers is that probably is going to be a reduction in charitable giving. Um, this is also a product of the fact that um, the estate tax is substantially reduced, and that's a big tax incentive for charitable giving. Um, and there should also be some decrease in home prices at the high end because of that uh, reduction in uh, the uh, mortgage interest deduction and the number of people that are itemizing in general. Um, so there's a lot more we can talk about on this, but I think I will wrap up so we can so, get through the other discussions. All right, so but before we move on, I'm gonna use uh, moderator's uh, discretion to ask a question. Uh, so are these models just already being proven wrong? So you've, you've set up uh, distributional tables. You've talked about how some of the models suggested there would be relatively little growth effect and so workers wouldn't benefit, but corporations have announced now a raft of bonuses suggesting that the tax bill is already raising the amounts people are taking home, um, even before we get to actual tax cuts they would be getting starting this month. So are these models right or are they just proven wrong and people are already seeing pay increases due to the tax bill? Well, I I think the thing we should pay more attention to is the changes in withholding and people's tax payments next year as opposed to these announcements. So uh, there have been a bunch of announcements in the press. There have also been a bunch of announcements of layoffs. Um, and the question is really what would have happened uh, if this bill hadn't been enacted. And the economy is actually doing pretty well. So chances are there'd be a fair amount of announcements of hiring and of bonuses regardless. And it's sort of hard for us to know the counterfactual. Um, you may know this better than me, David, so feel free to respond to your own question. But I don't think that these bonuses actually represent a substantial share of the workforce. Uh, and, you know, having worked in the White House, there is certainly a tendency for White Houses to like to take credit for things that would have happened already. So um, if you are a large multinational business that's planning to pay some bonuses or uh, increase wages and you have a bunch of regulatory priorities before the administration, you might want to go in and talk to the president and say, we're going to do this and, you know, feel free to claim credit for your great tax bill causing this, even though we were planning to do this three months ago. And so I think we just can't know how much that is driven by this bill versus what have happened anyhow. So, and, and ju just to add a little bit of gloss there, um, so I like, I, one, one poll suggested about 2% of workers said they were getting something that like the firm had said was due to the tax cut bill. Um, on top of that, in some cases, it's actually a tax game. The corporations are trying to write off compensation against a higher tax rate before their tax rate flips lower, and they're probably accelerating pay. The final thing I would say um, is that one thing that the models do suggest that Lily was showing, 
um, is that this is probably good for shareholders. So if the corporations are acting in the shareholders' own interests, they should continue a lobbying campaign for a tax cut bill that they know will be debated over the next several years. And so some of the announcements one should at least take with that in mind. Corporations are continuing an effort that they already had to get the bill and now to yeah. preserve the bill. And you know, one other thing to add is if we go back to these distributional charts, um, a bunch of the tax cut that you see for people here is actually um, supposed to be corporations raising people's wages. So, um, and you know, maybe they are doing so for 2%. The other problem is most of the announcements have been bonuses, not wage increases. So if you're a worker, you'd much rather have a permanent wage increase than a one-time bonus. All right, so Dan. Okay, great. So, uh, well, proponents of the 2017 Act promised that it would create lots of good jobs. Uh, they were right in at least one respect. Uh, it's created jobs for tax lawyers. Uh, now, when you have the question, how should business income be taxed, uh, people disagree about a lot of it, but one thing I think you'd get a lot of agreement about is it should be as featureless and as transparent as possible, because that means people will just do what makes sense from a business standpoint. Uh, and violating that, as the Act really did, is bad for tax policy, but it is good for, again, good for careers in tax law, so all you first years out there, keep this in mind when you're deciding what to register for in the fall. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'm going to address two aspects, the corporate rate cut and the so-called pass-through deduction. So corporate rate cut, it used to be 35%. It's now been cut to 21%. The corporate rate has almost always been lower than the individual rate, uh, both in the US and in other countries. It's mainly for an old reason that's kind of faded a bit and for a new reason that's been growing. The old reason for the corporate rate being lower was that there's a second level of tax. The company earns income, it's taxed, it pays dividends to the shareholders, they're taxed. So it was thought that uh, kind of the first tax should be lower so that the overall thing isn't discouraged too much. That's faded a bit uh, for a couple of reasons as a rationale for cutting the corporate rate. One is that uh, the dividend tax rate was, was reduced to 20%. A second is that actually there are a whole lot of uh, ta US companies are mainly held by tax exempt shareholders. So as a result, the second level of tax doesn't arise that much. So that kind of reason is faded. But the other reason for having a lower corporate tax rate has increased in recent years, and that's simply global tax competition. Uh, so like me as an NYU law prof, I'm not really benefiting from global tax competition. I'm going to kind of teach and work in the US and get taxed by the US. But if I'm a company uh, in a global business environment, I'm in a kind of different picture. Likewise, if an investor deciding what company to buy stock in, uh, I can build a factory in one country or another. And also, even if my factories are where they are, I can report my profits in one country or another. Uh, so companies have a lot of flexibility to respond to uh, global tax competition, different countries offering lower tax rates, either through what they actually do or simply through their paper shuffling. And by the way, just to give you an example of the paper shuffling, uh, Bermuda in 2010, uh, U.S. companies reported, multinationals reported $94 billion of profits arising there. Uh, Bermuda's uh, GDP for the year was $6 billion. Uh, so that's a bit of a difference. Anyway, uh, there's been a wide, the U.S. tax, uh, corporate tax rate has been higher than other countries' tax rate. And there's actually been a, a fairly widespread belief that the U.S. corporate tax rate ought to be cut. Uh, because of uh, what's happened in other countries. Now, I'm talking about the statutory rate. The effective rate is different. Uh, the effective rate is how much you actually pay, and there it's not necessarily true that U.S. companies were hit harder than other companies. Nonetheless, the statutory rate uh, does matter. Now, if you look at public opinion polls, the public seems to, have want, to want higher corporate taxes, but there's actually been a widespread view in the, quote, expert sector that the corporate tax rate should be cut. For example, if you look in politics, really, not only the Republicans, but Democrats through what I would call the Obama wing of the party uh, also favored cutting corporate taxes. The Bernie wing of the party, perhaps not, uh, but there was sort of a lot of people who thought the corporate tax rate should be cut. Academics also, I think it's fair to say, have generally supported different beliefs that the corporate tax rate should be cut, but with three caveats. The first is that you pay for it. You don't like just have unfunded uh, deficits to increases to have it. So you have to be responsible. You have to pay for it. The second is you have to address the overall distributional effects of doing it. What those are is complicated, but if you care about distributional policy, you've got to address them. That. And the third is there have to be safeguards. 
What do we mean by that? Again, if we cut the corporate tax rate because we're competing with other countries, either for real factories or for fake bookkeeping to say that a profit arose there, that doesn't really apply to me. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, I think it makes sense, but no one else will agree. If I can go to Dean Morrison and say, uh, could you pay the Shaviro Corp instead of paying Daniel Shaviro? That way my tax rate will only be 21%. So you really need safeguards to, uh, to make a much lower corporate rate than the individual rate makes sense, and that simply was not done at all. So actually when they passed the rate, the 21% rate, they didn't do any of this. They not only didn't pay for it, but had, uh, but had matching uh, further tax cuts. They not only didn't address the distributional aspects, but in other ways made the the regressivity even greater, as Lily was just saying. Uh, and there's a really a complete absence of safeguards to make sure that it's really used for global tax competition, not for people who might enjoy getting a lower tax rate on their salaries. Uh, so that's uh, really w the main reason I would criticize what happened. Just to sort of show what, how these things work, uh, not only I, but a lot of people who you know, might be more likely, to, to be honest, to vote for the Democratic than the Republican candidate, would be willing under the right circumstances to go to, say, a 15% corporate rate. It really depends upon what surrounds it, and again, how you pay for it, how you uh, address any distributional issues, and how you have safeguards so that it's really only used for the sector where the U.S. is subject to global tax competition, not just as a way for high-income people to cut their tax rate. So one upshot of this, and one reason why the tax lawyers are going to have some fun, or at least be paid, I don't know how much fun it'll be, uh, is uh, that uh, there basically any high-income person who is not forced to be an employee as a, uh, for tax purposes is going to be thinking about, should I do this? And the upside is, wow, the tax rate is 21 percent. That's better than 37. The downside, though, is that then you can't kind of get the money out of the company without questions about facing the dividend rate. So it's simply a trade-off that they're going to be figuring out what to do about. It. Another thing they're going to worry about is what if the law changes? I become a corporation, then the law becomes less favorable to this. Okay, onto the pass-through deduction. So a lot of, sorry, I think because I just got a note about three minutes, I'm going to start talking even faster. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yes, yes, there is still room to, uh, to up the, uh, anyway. Uh, so a lot of U.S. businesses run through outside corporate form. People have partnerships, they have what are called S-corporations, they have sole proprietorships. These are often called pass-through businesses because if, even if there's a legal entity, like a partnership, the income is actually passed through and taxed at the individual level. And uh, real estate is in there, tends to be in this, oil and gas, finance, lots of other big businesses. Uh, and also, of course, a law firm would be an example of someone who operates that way. Now, some folks in this center, in this sector, including U.S. senators, said, the corporate people got theirs, we should get ours. It was really nothing more fancy than that. It's unfair to us. I'm quoting Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, who stood to benefit by millions. Uh, it's unfair to us if we don't get our tax cut, too. Uh, so as a result, what Congress decided to do is not to sort of offset the corporate tax cut, but to expand it so people would get it without having to incorporate. Well, why can't these people just incorporate? As I just said, uh, many, and I think the answer is many of them will. Many of them will just incorporate. But they also, some of them wanted a straight out tax cut without this kind of niggling nuisance of, oh, now I am the corporation, I can't get the money out without worrying about paying additional tax. They wanted to get it straight up so what Congress did for them was it gave a 20% deduction for certain types of business income that are earned by people who are not employees. Uh, what that basically means is it lowers the marginal rate you face by 20%. So if your rate is 37%, you can, but you can deduct 20% of it, your rate is actually only 29.6%, which is 80% of that. Uh, so they just did this uh, 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 really because these people, it's not fair to us if they get theirs and they don't, Get our, and we don't get ours, and we don't want to have to incorporate, even though we might do anyway. They put in some so-called gu guardrails, but they're not very effective, partly because there's really no underlying principle for who gets it and who doesn't, and the revenue cost of this is about $400 billion. Now, a key thing that happened here that'll matter to people in the room is they didn't want to give it to professionals. It's for, quote, business people. It's not for doctors, it's not for lawyers, it's not for accountants, it's not for artists, it's not for athletes. Why? Uh, well, first of all, these people can incorporate if they like, if it works for them, but why? I think the reason is basically sociological. If you've either like watched, say, the 2016 and 2012 presidential campaigns, or if you've read a lot of American literature, you kind of know that there's a long-standing sociological divide in our country between people among relatively affluent people, the sort of so-called business class, and the professional, educated, intellectual, even academic class. These are just sort of different groups. 
And those guys wanted this for themselves. They're kind of willing to let us get the corporate rate, but this is for them, it's not for us. Uh, so they put in rules that basically denied it to doctors and lawyers and, and the like, and athletes and artists and so forth. But engineers and architects got out at the last second. They got to someone in the conference and they can now do it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the result is that this, this tax cut, uh, this 20% rate is available for non-employees but not for lawyers. So what does this mean for you guys? Well, a couple of things. One is, uh, if you go work for a law firm, you can't get the uh, tax cut, uh, the, the partners can't get the 20% tax cut because they're in the law business, more on that in a second. Uh, you can't because you're an employee. So what law firms may do is form a partnership of associates, believe it or not, so that you're, quote, a partner in the associateship that gives services to the partners, and perhaps you get your 20% uh, deduction. Is that good for you? Well, not necessarily. They might just cut your wages by 20%, sorry. Uh, uh, meanwhile, what do the partners do? Well, they'll do two things. Uh, they'll consider incorporating. They'll also do things to get some of it, like, for example, how valuable is the name Sullivan and Cromwell, just to name one, or Davis Polk? How valuable are these names? What would you pay for the ability to do business as Davis Polk? Probably a lot. So the Davis Polk partners could form two partnerships, and one will charge the other for the use of the name Davis Polk. The Law Services Partnership can't get the 20% tax cut, uh, but the Davis Polk Partnership of IP that owns this valuable trade name, they will get it. And believe me, they'll charge themselves through the nose for it so that they get as much uh, of the 20% cut as possible. Anyway, this the whole thing is very unstable, and I think, it, again, getting back to the tax lawyers, there's basically no one who's high income and who is not uh, uh, perforce and unavoidably an employee for tax purposes who is not going to be thinking about both of these routes. And of course, thinking about it means they're going to be hiring lawyers to help them think about it. So that's why it might be good news uh, for the people who take tax one in the fall. So question about the 20% deduction. So especially given the fact that corporations were seeing such rate cuts, didn't there need to be some sort of tax relief for small businesses? And like we know small businesses, the way small businesses get structured, so if you go to your bodega, like they don't, they're, they're not a corporation. They, you know, often they might have a Schedule C where they report their income or maybe they're a partnership. Um, and so isn't this actually sort of just a way of providing tax relief to small business job creators? Well, as you well know, <laughs> uh, the enormous uh, preponderance of the benefit goes to big businesses, goes to people like the Koch brothers or R Senator Ron Johnson, oil and gas. So it's really not primarily for them. And also, uh, again, it's it, it narrows the disparity between the corporate rate and the sort of non-corporate rate. But those, one, those guys who could just incorporate and two, uh, it, it uh, expands the disparity between being a, quote, business owner and an employee. And that, I think, makes no sense at all. It really means a dollar isn't a dollar anymore. It depends on how you earn it. There's an article in the New York Times of Patricia, Patricia Cohn saying two guys working side by side as chefs, one is getting the pass through rule, the other isn't. They have the same salary, they have different taxes. So, and j just, uh, well, I, I do think one aspect of this would, would, could make it a more durable aspect of the tax code, I think, unfortunately. They were choosing between two ways to do this. One way would have been like a top rate of like 25%, which truly would have been only focused at the very, very top. Uh, they instead provided a 20% deduction, uh, which can potentially reach a greater swath of people, even though it's disproportionately for the top. So I remember I did an interview with uh, like a medical like magazine for like you know, that some doctors read, and like I was just saying how horrible this deduction is, but the headline there was like, medical doctors' offices, great new thing for all of you, assuming they make less than three hundred fifteen thousand dollars in taxable income. If they're above it, they don't get it because they're. Yeah, I think like, I forgot to mention that that yeah, right. The, so like the, the reason why the, the like it's possible that the associate who then becomes a partner gets it is they created these income thresholds where they say if you make less than three hundred fifteen thousand taxable income for a married couple, half half, half for singles, you can get the twenty percent deduction so long as you're not an employee. So long as you're not an employee, that means that you know. So let's say you're like a you know medical practitioner, you make two hundred thousand dollars a year, um, and you could be getting twenty percent basically off your top tax rate, which sounds good. Uh, so imagine a politician running in 2020. Are you going to run and say that you're gonna raise taxes on the doctor making $200,000? You should, it's a terrible tax policy. 
which also disproportionately benefits the very top. But they structure it in such a way that it has broader effects than just at the very top. Well, two things, a, a serious point and then just a, a joke point, but that's true that I just thought I'd throw in. The first one is that <laughs> the so-called pass-throughs are very, very politically powerful. I was talking to a friend who I used to work with who actually is now like uh, a DC honcho who works on behalf of the multinational companies. And I said to him, how are you feeling? Not as great as you expected, huh? And he said, yeah, that's right, because one way to put it is that the multinationals may be liked by Congress, but the pass-throughs are well-liked uh, in Willie Loman's terms. Uh, they're much more powerful and much more popular, and it's going to be very hard to take it away. Uh, the second is I just wanted to mention one of the beneficiaries of this. What do tax professors do in their spare time? Well, one thing they do is there's this sort of, believe it or not, tax prof uh, discussion group. And the question arose, <laughs> Can drug dealers take the 20% deduction? Uh, there's a rule that says that drug dealers aren't allowed any business deductions. So if you hire your mule to, well, let's not get into that, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they can't deduct any of their business expenses. But they, due to the exact terminology, they can deduct this. So the drug dealers, I guess, will be lobbying Congress as well as the $200,000 doctor. <laughs> One other just perverse aspect of this deduction, and I think we we may all pile on a bit about the pass-through deduction. Um, is David mentioned that it, there are more guardrails above $315,000. They will be easy to avoid for many businesses. Um, but there are generally no guardrails below that, with the exception that you can't be an employee. And so uh, another concern that David and I have written a bit about is that this creates a big incentive to become an independent contractor. So it's good for people who are already Uber drivers. Um, but it creates an incentive for more and more people to become independent contractors in order to get this 20% deduction. And um, you know that may be positive for them in the short term or just looking at the deduction, but in the process, people are uh, generally going to have to give up their employee benefits. So things like health insurance, retirement <laughs> savings, life insurance, workers' compensation. Um, so one of the concerns is people will sort of look at the immediate interest, talk to their accountant, their accountant will say, this will be great for you to become an independent contractor and not realize that they're really giving up a lot of their safety net in doing so. Mitchell. It pains me to say anything positive about this piece <laughs> of legislation, but here it goes. The international provisions of the legislation in some ways are not as horrible as the corporate and pass-through yeah. provisions. By the way, I completely agree with that this. Dan just described. Fault lines are the Achilles heel of the tax law and also the lifeblood of the tax lawyer. So fault lines we're familiar with is a distinguished categories of tax relevance like debt versus equity. So a poor tax system draws formalistic lines between categories that's easy to cross from one to the other that has massive consequences and doesn't track anything of substantive merit. That's pretty much a good description of what Dan just talked about with respect to pass-through and also uh, the games that one can play with the corporate rate. Now that doesn't describe what's going on in the international space. So the international provisions are wrestling with a fault line about how we tax US activity versus foreign activity. That's a perennial fault line. It must be dealt with. Uh, and, the, and the provisions do grapple with that to, to some extent. The tragedy in my mind is that this part of the act, I think maybe even uniquely so, uh, could have in a sound legislative environment generated true bipartisan reform that would have generated a lot of revenue and made for sound policy going forward. And we did completely fail to achieve that. So um, this is a very complex area of the law, so I'm just gonna scratch the, the surface in a few minutes. Uh, and a lot of people in the room don't have experience with the technical aspects or have even taken a first class in tax law. But I think you're familiar with some of the basic issues, because they have a lot of, of popular resonance. They deal with some of the biggest US companies and their issues you read about on the front page of the New York Times. So I thought I would uh, think about or talk about three particular issues, and you can have in mind, uh, if you want to think about tech companies, think about an Apple. If you want to think about a more standard company, think about a company like GE. And so they're really uh, three issues. They get muddled together in these discussions. They're all there. The international rules all affect them. But let's see if we can tease them out. So the first issue is jobs. Uh, and the question there is, 
does a differential or preferential tax treatment of foreign activity encourage the shift of jobs uh, from the United States to abroad? The second issue is what I'm going to call uh, absurdly low tax rates uh, with respect to foreign activity. So Dan referenced the experience of Bermuda. If you want to do it at the company level, it was reported a year or two ago that on foreign income, Apple was paying 50 cents per $1 million of profit on foreign activity. Okay, that suggests something is wrong. <laughs> yeah. The third issue is, is uh, that of trapped earnings. So again, to, to pick on Apple, uh, estimates are that Apple, uh, at the time of the enactment of this legislation, had maybe $250 billion uh, in cash uh, held outside the United States. If you add up the earnings of all U.S. companies offshore currently, it's well over a trillion dollars. So again, a big issue of import. So what I thought I'd do is just talk about each of these uh, very quickly, tell you what the law did, and I was going to pause after each and see if my uh, panelists wanted to chime in on anything. So first off, on, on trapped earnings, let me just explain how this issue arises. So under old law, the way it would work with respect to foreign companies owned by U.S. companies is we would tax the bulk of the profits only when the profits were returned to the United States. So if Apple, for example, was achieving a very low tax rate on foreign earnings, what that meant was they faced a massive tax liability upon paying their profits back to the U.S. They didn't want to do that. It's even worse than it might sound because back in 2005, we had a tax holiday that drastically lowered the rate on sending profits back. And although at the time it was advertised as a one-time holiday, that rhetoric lasted for about a year or two, and then people started lobbying for the next one. And at that point, no one wanted to pay any profits back because who wanted to be like, the company that paid the profits back the year before? A tax holiday. So these accumulated earnings just kept um, getting larger uh, and larger and larger. So what the, what the legislation does here is to impose a, what's called a one-time repatriation tax. So everyone basically has to pay a tax currently on the offshore earnings that are uh, currently not in the United States, but at a lower rate than would have applied if they had paid them back under old law. So roughly a shade over 15% uh, tax rate with respect to cash uh, held um, overseas. And then going forward, we move to what's called a territorial system. So in future, there will be no additional tax when the profits are paid back to the United States. So let me I just make a few observations here. So one, I, I think the, the removal of what people have called uh, lock-in or lock-out, the disincentive to return cash, I think is sound policy, and I think a, a lot of people would, would agree with that. Uh, second point is that this is one of the few revenue raisers uh, in the bill, so we have to pay for all these nice benefits in some way. So this is estimated, scored to raise about $224 billion, big number, so maybe we should be happy about that. Uh, but you know, there's a question out there, which is, was that the right number? You know, it's, it's conceivable we could have raised much more. Um, this was a unique moment in tax legislation. So as in the 2005 holiday, we said, oh, it's a one-time event, no one believed it. This is literally a one-time event. We were not going to have a shift uh, from a worldwide to territorial system again in right, decades, foreseeable future. So this was a one-time shot to reach these earnings. Um, you didn't, I mean, yeah, companies are gonna pay a lot of money with respect to this, but they're also right, benefiting a lot under uh, this legislation as well. You didn't hear a lot of complaining uh, about the repatriation tax, certainly not enough to slow it down, which tells me there was more cushion to uh, probably tax more of it. So we might have left a lot of money um, on the table. Um, one other uh, thing I'll mention here is I have a view that this uh, will do little or nothing for the economy broadly. So I think there's a naive view that you know, is like shared by uh, politicians perhaps that there's like a, you know, a trillion and a half dollars of cash sitting in safe deposit boxes and banks in the Cayman Islands and now this is all gonna flood back into the United States and do great things. It's just not how international capital markets work. And so when you know, CEOs were asked about this provision, oh, what are you going to do? They kind of scratched their head. Well, we don't know what we're going to do. And that's because they are not, in general, sitting on unfunded projects they wanted to undertake. Uh, 
if they wanted to do projects, right, we've been in a low interest rate environment for a long time, there's foreign owned capital, people were funding the stuff they wanted to do. So I don't really predict a big economic effect from it. So I'll pause there, I know Dan, at least I know, has <laughs> Uh, firm views on um, yeah, many of these issues. I'll just say, well, a couple of things. One is the international tax policy field is a funny field because it's, even among the academics, it's surprisingly partisan, by which I don't mean Democratic versus Republican or something, but I mean like kind of the sort of pro-taxing the companies more and pro-taxing the companies less. And the reason for this debate is partly that there are arguments on each side. That said, really no one on either side thought that deferral as such made sense because it just Really what it did was not, quote, prevent the companies from investing in the U.S., but it made the, the chief financial officer play tw games of Twister with how I get the money here to the project there, which was wasteful and stupid and uh, cost them something. and clearly worth eliminating, but it's, again, I agree with Mitchell. It's not a flood of, of capital uh, racing into the U.S. By the way, some of the money that's going to, quote, come home now was already held in dollars in U.S. banks. One other thing just to note on, on this, I've in talking to people who aren't tax people, I've heard a lot say, well, oh, these $2 trillion, they're gonna have to bring them back and there's gonna be huge investment in the US. And that's really a misunderstanding of this provision. So it is a one-time tax on that $2 trillion at a much lower rate than would have applied. Um, but it isn't contingent on bringing that money back or investing it in any way in the US. That was a proposal that had occurred, there had been proposals for another one-time holiday and maybe making it contingent on certain investments, um, but that's not what this does. I, I think it is a component of, all, and actually a lot of the components of the international reforms are things that both Democrats and Republicans had proposed with different rates uh, and, and elements, but overall the, the structure is similar, and, and I think this piece of it is a sensible structure, but it's not, there's nothing in it that creates a big incentive to suddenly invest that $2 trillion in the US. All right, I'm just gonna, uh, so I'm short on time, I'm just gonna say a, a very quick word about jobs and then say uh, more about the um, uh, low tax on uh, shifted profits. So with respect to jobs, I'll make a, a political point here, which has interested me. So I think um, yeah, the idea that uh, preferential treatment of foreign activity is a primary or even at all meaningful cause for the shift of jobs is generally rejected by people who study this area. And the problem or issue there is that the tax effect just gets dwarfed by non-tax factors. So for costs of labor inputs, for example, the difference between making stuff uh, in a developed country that's uh, has highly regulated labor markets, uh, the cost difference is just so, so much uh, greater than in other countries that the tax difference isn't really affecting it. And what's interesting is that the tax burden on foreign activity did go down in this legislation. That's in part because of the territorial aspect and in part because of the general corporate rate cut. So one might have thought, given the rhetoric of the 2016 presidential campaign about jobs, this would have at least become a discussion point that, wait, what are we doing? We're affecting the tax system in a certain way to tax foreign income less onerously. And that was just completely absent. Uh, and I was just a, a wrong prognosticator on that because back in September, I said, well, of course they can't just favor a territorial shift without having to wrestle with this issue that it seems, uh, at least to the popular consciousness, in conflict with the jobs argument. But that argument was, uh, and debate was completely absent. All right, um, just a, uh, if I have a minute or two left on, on low tax profits. So uh, international tax planning of the last two decades in 15 seconds. All right. <laughs> Develop your IP in Silicon Valley. Uh, shift ownership of the IP to the Caribbean sell glossy, beautiful products into high-income uh, destination market jurisdictions without paying much tax there, uh, book your profits in the Caribbean, don't pay the income back to the U.S. and pay very uh, low tax uh, sort of in perpetuity on, on the foreign activities. So what's, uh, that's the state of the world. So this is a phenomenon that's been labeled stateless income. It's the low tax income I was talking about at the beginning. And what's fascinating here is we, we hit a sort of rupture point where no one was happy about that, either in the jurisdictions where the IP was produced and developed or in the jurisdictions where the glossy products are being sold. So the market countries have responded in their role as market countries. So that's the story of EU member states telling Ireland, hey, you've got to collect more money 
from Apple. Uh, so those countries are going after the profit, and the U.S. You know, I think maybe uh, somewhat sensibly said, "Well, wait a second. We have a claim on that profit. We we want to go after it." Uh, and so the, the legislation enacts uh, some provisions that attempt to, to do that. Uh, so in one uh, instance, the legislation attempts to tax what's called global intangible low taxed income. You might think, okay, that sounds great. Sounds like we solved the problem. We're going exactly after that low tax stuff. The problem, coming back to fault lines, is it's really hard to separate the basket we want to reach from the basket of what I'll call right, legitimate good, real foreign activity, the stuff that we don't want to tax and we want to exempt when the profits are returned. Hard drafting problem. So what did the legislation do? Well, it said we're not, we're not even going to try to figure out what's intangible versus tangible. We're just going to add up your tangible assets and deem a return on it, deem a 10% return, and then everything above that gets taxed. Okay, a few observations. The problem is 10% is a pretty high deemed return on tangible assets. And so to the extent that exceeds the actual return on tangible assets, you're generating a cushion or shelter for all of your intangible income. Further, perversely, if tangible assets right, shelter your intangible income, we've generated a new incentive to do what? Shift tangible assets outside of the United States in order to achieve further low tax uh, results on this income. Uh, so this is all playing out. It's you know, hard to know exactly how taxpayers will plan here. I think we know the direction of it, but if you, know, you ask me right now, oh, am I feeling bold on the US you know, collecting new large amounts with respect to global intangible income, my answer is no. Great. Yeah, no, that's uh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to sort of wrap up with a few before we go to um, uh, a question for the panel and then questions for you guys. Uh, just a few thoughts on the overall faults in the structure of this bill and the faults in the process through which it was enacted, and which will lead to a, a sort of a broad topic that we've are, that we've been discussing here, which is game, which we might call tax games. And we wrote paper that was in fact titled, The Games They Will Play. So in terms of the basic fault and structure, um, so Dan you know, discussed how we have cut now the corporate rate to 21% and also now have a special 20% deduction. All of these things, may, meaning that certain flavors of income avoid the top individual income tax rate, which is set at 37%. So, as Mitchell was saying, when you have fault lines in the tax system, that is the territory of the tax lawyer, especially if there are, you know, those lines are formalistic and if there are ways to cross them. And here, there are. As a result, the 37% top individual income tax rate becomes theoretical. Sure, some people will pay it, but you can just bet that a lot of the work of tax lawyers and accountants in the coming years will be to advise their clients how, to, so how they do not have to pay the 37% top rate. There was already a category of income that was easily avoided the 37, uh, top rate, which was capital gains. There were a set of games that people played to convert from ordinary income to capital gains. You can be sure there will now be a whole set of new games that people are going to be playing to try to convert income either to C-corps and then trying to avoid the second layer of tax or to pass-throughs and getting the 20% deduction. Just to give a sense for like, one kind of game and how, I mean, it's so a pretty easy one. Um, so let's say you're, you choose to go into business with some other people and you choose to incorporate and you pay a top rate of 21%. Now the whole issue is how you avoid the 20% tax rate that applies when you either dividend out the income or you sell your shares in the corporation. So you may say, okay, so that's gonna be hard. Hard to avoid the second level of tax. Well, here's one game you die. Um, now, admittedly, that requires a relatively significant event, but there are a set of people out there who are planning to pass on assets to their heirs, including potentially businesses, and when you die, you get step up into basis at death. The second level of tax gets eliminated. You might then worry, wait a moment, I'm like doing well, money is being made in my corporation. Yeah, sure, I'd like to give money to my heirs, but I'd also like to buy a boat. How can I do that? It doesn't seem like I can avoid the second level of tax. Wait a moment, borrow, 
borrow against the stock. You don't have to realize the gain. You can borrow against the stock and then pass the, the, the uh, stock down to your heirs to get step up in basis and you get a 21% top rate. That obviously is one structure. There are other structures. And as Dan said, unfortunately, this law did not take that problem seriously at all and did not build in any kind of safeguards to try to avoid that. So you can even see the kind of games when it comes to other elements. So the rate structure was a key problem. Another key problem came when it comes to some of the offsets they were using in the bill and how they didn't seriously think through the ways people respond behaviorally, including state governments. So let me, that brings me to another topic, which is the state and local tax deduction. So the, one of the largest offsets in the bill, raising approximately a trillion dollars uh, if it was continued um, past 2025 when it expires, so about a trillion dollars over a 10-year window, um, is getting rid of or significantly limiting the deduction for state and local taxes. Whereas before, you could deduct, if you were itemizing from your income, state and local taxes with some limits because of the alternative minimum tax, you now are limited to a total deduction for income and property taxes of $10,000. Okay, so uh, we wrote in our paper, along with others who are working with us, that states and state and local governments would potentially have ways to avoid that. They could potentially set up charitable of uh, trust, which you could give uh, charitable gifts to, and they would then give you a, ta a credit against income ta individual income taxes. And suddenly an area which is not restricted, charitable deductions, becomes the way the state tries to finance itself in order to preserve deductibility. They may also flip weight, um, income taxes on wages to payroll taxes paid by employers, which remain deductible. And miracle of miracles, state and local governments are discussing this. <laughs> You might, you, uh, you could, the, the New York state government put out a 30 page report on options about various ways they could do charitable giving and payroll taxes. The state of California is also moving on a number of these. Not shocking that those might be two states that would tend to be, be under pressure and may be moving on this. And none of this was, at least as we could tell, considered in the way they structured that offset. We can have different opinions about what we think of the state and local tax deduction and whether it should be limited. But at the very least, if you were going to limit it in order to try to pay for your bill, you may want to read the paper that was telling you how states were going to respond to it and try to take that into account. I'm which, personally hoping they won't read the paper, though. Right, well, <laughs> or that they ignored it. I think some of them read it. Um, now, it was not just a problem of structure where there were some, I think, some key issues that got ignored. It was also a problem of process. These bills were introduced at the beginning of November. They were made law by the end of December. And it's true, tax bills have over time sometimes been enacted very quickly. Um, we've, you know, so you can sometimes see bills, the cutting rates that get pushed through really quickly. This is a different tax bill. This is a tax bill that's, having funda that's making fundamental changes to the, to the base of the tax system, creating whole new structures around international, around pass-throughs. And if you're gonna do that, you might want to take some time to figure out what it's doing. Um, and they didn't. And it can be compared to, say, the process in 1986, which is the last ma time we've seen major changes to the tax base. We had years of tr the Treasury Department producing long reports, a, a long process of consideration in Congress, which did not happen here. And so it's not just that there are then loopholes that don't get taken into account. You see, I mean, like, just to give one example of sloppiness, and there's going to be much, much else that's out there, through the 20% deduction, they accidentally blew up the farm sector. Whoops. Uh, they <laughs> accidentally gave a major tax break to, co to uh, farm cooperatives uh, like, and didn't give it to others. And if they don't fix it, which they probably will since it's just so egregious, uh, the farm sector would entirely transform and major corporations might go out of business and others would suddenly be preferenced. Um, that's just one example. Now, they'll probably fix it since there are some major corporations that might go out of business um, or have to change significantly, but it's an example of what happens when you legislate these kinds of complex issues so, so quickly. So, um, I guess I, I had one question. Before we go to questions, which, is, which we should do, I just wanted to poll the, the panel for a quick poll. Um, we've heard a lot of complaints. You can tell we're not huge fans. Um, but I might ask, uh, what is your favorite part, and what's maybe your least favorite part, but maybe even spend a little bit more time on your favorite part, since we've heard a lot about least favorite. So I'm just curious, before we go on, a favorite part 
of this bill, something good you can say. So I might start off, we'll go down the line. Lily. Um, so I have two favorite parts. Okay. Um, the first would be there is a limit on uh, interest deductibility for corporations. And one of the big problems um, with the business sector for a long time has been there's a big tax preference for debt financing over equity financing because interest payments are deductible whereas dividends are not. And people have written you know, papers and done analyses looking at how this may increase systemic risk in the economy when you have highly leveraged companies and then you have a financial crisis like we had. And um, so I, I think there's a real argument for limiting the interest deduction and the bill did that to some extent. Um, I'm not sure, you know, it may not have gone far enough for been as tight as I would like, but I think it's a move in the right direction. Um, and then I'd say my other favorite provision subject to being uh, taught that it should not be by some of our international tax experts is there's an international provision called the B. Um, which is a, a kind of novel proposal to address earning stripping by what are called inbound companies. So it's a foreign multinational that does business in the US. And um, it has historically been the case that those companies are able to strip earnings out of the US. So they might load up the US subsidiary with lots of debt and that subsidiary will take lots of deductions um, and reduce their US income. And we haven't had a lot of tools to address that. We've had some. Um, and we've been, uh, a lot of the proposals focused very much on profit shifting by US multinationals and not by foreign ones. And really both are a problem. And so I thought that was sort of a clever feature of the bill and, and a surprise in that among the international provisions that one hadn't, you know, which can be very risky, had not been out there in some form before. I think the uh, best thing about the bill is that it could have been even worse. <laughs> uh, so I just flag one provision in particular. So the House version of the bill, as you probably saw, would have taxed uh, tuition waivers of graduate students. And I think it would have been disastrous for higher education. It represented uh, it's kind of the culture war that Dan was talking about still in the pass through, the sort of. Uh, dismissal and hatred of uh, education and universities. I was very happy that that dropped out. But I should really point to something in particular, and I had to really pour through uh, with, with a lot of effort, and then I found it. It's amendments to code section 5051, um, <laughs> which snuck in at the 11th hour. This goes to David's process point. These people were uh, you know, busy. How, how did this sneak in at the last hour? So what is it? Uh, it's a 350 per barrel reduction in the excise tax for craft brewers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a big fan of beer, uh, so <laughs> I personally love this provision. So I did a little calculation, uh, and I figured that that roughly accounts to, a, if, if it's fully passed through to the consumer, a 10 cents per growler fill uh, reduction. It, and you're laughing, right? But that's, that's real money. If you can put down 15 growlers a week, <laughs> that's $1.50. <laughs> Over the year, that will pay for your Costco membership. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm tempted, of course I won't come to temptation, but I'm tempted to be spiteful and to say that my favorite thing, although it really is the thing that gives me the most pleasure about it is, the fact that they were unable to name it, that it's a nameless act. I just like that. That makes me happy in some small way. Uh, I'm also glad, I was really worried that they were going to rename it the Internal Revenue Code of 2017. Really, it's not worthy of that. And uh, I, I think the Senate parliamentarian who struck the name also struck that. On a more serious note, I think, uh, really echoing what's been said before, I think both a couple of the international tax provisions, the so-called beat and the guilty, and uh, the interest deduction limit for companies that Lily mentioned, I would call them all good first drafts. Unfortunately, I don't know what the later drafts will be, but they're actually all movements towards having a rule that makes sense. They didn't quite get it right in two months, but uh, they're good first drafts. So. I would echo all of that in terms of the things that were best. And I think if I were to add one more, and uh, it's merely because if those of you who are in my uh, uh, income tax know that I'm vaguely obsessed with food, and especially Silicon Valley food, <laughs> and the fact they're able to fully write off and no one has to include in their income, and I find myself desperately jealous. 
Um, and so I, I, I had to take a certain amount of pleasure despite the fact that I can no longer teach this, the fact that the Silicon Valley firms are at least limited to a 50% deduction on the amazing food that they serve under the bill. <laughs> um, so with that, I thought we might go see if there are uh, any questions out there. Sure, the student right there. So it seems like one of the summaries is that there are a lot of new loopholes in this law and that they weren't really well drafted and it's not really well considered, but you guys also talked about a lot of loopholes under the previous review. I'm wondering what, you know, what was kind of distinctive about these new loopholes that makes them worse? You know, if there are tax lawyers you could get around before, why is it any different now? Well, my feeling is that uh, it's much bigger than it was before, with the exception of international. In international, there were so many to begin with that it's not clear they've made it worse. But for example, the passenger deduction is just a brand new one. Uh, all the things that people will be trying to do now, there are ways of doing it before, but the kind of, uh, the, the ways of doing it are much bigger. They, it, there's an old saying that a tax lawyer's job is to drive a truck through a pinprick in order to get a uh, favorable result. Well, now you're driving a truck through kind of a hole that's at least like that. So that's just gonna be easier and there's gonna be more of it. And, and, I, and I would just sort of emphasize off that, it's the ability within the U.S. individual, individual income tax system to avoid the top rate, either by flipping over to the corporate or using the pass-through. And a lot of money is at stake there. And so while the international stuff may be a net improvement, uh, that particular, the games around that seem like they were likely to be very, very significant and potential. If you're just to compare prior system as, as to this one, I would tend to think this one's going to involve uh, even more effective tax planning. Uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the effects that you guys see from the uh, mortgage interest rate deduction tax. That's actually well, yeah. That's actually a change that we probably like. Uh, I think we probably all agree that if you are starting the world over again the home mortgage interest deduction really doesn't make sense. Uh, on the other hand, suppose it were repealed today cold. That would be pretty tough on a whole lot of people out there with homes and mortgages that would suddenly be underwater. So they're cutting the $750,000 principal amount. That's actually a progressive change considered in isolation. Also lowering the tax rate, having fewer itemizers. It moves towards a market for real estate that's more sane and rational. Now, of course, there could be some some uh, hair must, so to speak, on the way to that regime, but it is kind of a leading towards a better world in a certain way that'll be better for low-income people with limited credit, for example, or trying to buy homes. That was actually also on my list after the beer of things I liked. So uh, <laughs> the other part of that is the removal, the deduction for interest on home equity lines, which really was an inequitable feature of prior law that allowed homeowners to borrow against home equity uh, and finance everyday consumer expenditures. So people who don't own homes are paying astronomical, uh, you know, uh, non-deductible interest on credit cards. People who own homes are financing the exact same expenditures at a much lower rate uh, and deductible. And the removal of that, I think, is, is sound policy. Just to chime in, I, I agree that generally this is a, a move in the right direction, or it might have been good if in the first place we didn't have a mortgage interest deduction in the tax code. Um, there are some transition costs. Um, and you know both the reduction in the top amount of mortgage interest that uh, is eligible from a million to $750,000 will potentially affect home prices, but also the big reduction in itemizers means that even though the provision only applies to new home purchases, if you currently own a home and all of your you know, possibilities of purchasers are now not going to itemize or you were selling, lucky enough to be selling a home worth over $750,000, you're probably gonna get a lower purchase price than you would have before. So, um, so there, there are some transition costs to this. Um, the benefits are that uh, we already, even absent the mortgage interest deduction, have big tax preferences for home ownership over renting because uh, we don't tax the imputed uh, rental value of your home. And so this can create a bias in favor of home own ownership over renting when maybe people you know, would prefer to rent. They might think they might be moving in a few years and don't necessarily wanna buy a home. And so from a broader economic perspective, there's some real positives to not necessarily placing ads 
large a thumb on the scale in favor of home ownership. Right. The, the one aspect that I think um, of, of the sort of the overall policy around housing that did not get enough attention, and I actually, I mean, I've not thought enough about it, but it gives also sort of an example of what happens if you enact something in two months. Um, so in combination with reduction in the um, mortgage interest deduction, plus the fact that state and local taxes remain fully deductible for trader businesses, um, but not for individuals, it's possible that you might, and you'd have to like calculate it out, you might be in, begin getting a preference towards renting over owning in some markets, especially if they're high tax markets. Um, and so you could begin potentially seeing a flip over in like the housing stock from being owned by individuals to potentially being owned by, whether it's you know, a private equity fund, hedge fund, whatever it is, um, and renting. Uh, and it's just sort of like a dynamic, I actually haven't like thought through, but I have, I was in a room of sort of some investors, and they were actively discussing a possible large shifts in the housing market in some high tax areas, given the fact that the businesses, if they own the um, property, can continue to fully deduct taxes, but the individuals may be limited. One other thing to note, your question was on the mortgage interest deduction, but there's also big effects on real estate in the bill, um, or rather non-effects in some cases. So real estate, interestingly, um, was carved out of the repeal of like-kind exchanges, so they still can do like-kind exchanges. Um, they're eligible for the pass-through deduction in ways that a lot of other businesses are not. REITs, which are a kind of big uh, investment tool in real estate, are, are just automatically eligible for the pass-through deduction. So real estate as a whole may be a big winner, but uh, there's you know heterogeneity among that. Developers. Yeah. yeah. I didn't quite hear the question. Uh, so is this about whether or not the state and local governments may pick up some revenue due to the repatriation of, uh, or the, the, on, on the foreign profits? Yeah. So, I mean, a, a few quick thoughts, uh, and, and others may, may actually know more. There's actually really big issues here beyond just the, state, uh, the deductibility of state and local taxes for state, for, um, state governments. It depends how their systems are structured, but there are a lot of interconnections. So just to give an example, uh, a number of systems uh, connect to the standard deduction uh, for the federal standard deduction. The federal standard deduction doubled do they increase? A number of them connect in terms of itemized deductions. If itemized deductions do go down, do they stay connected? Expensing, you have immediate write-offs of investments. Does it have the same thing happen for the state tax systems? When it comes to the repatriation of funds, will the state government see an increase in revenue or not? How do they treat that? Um, they are like big questions out there. Actually, there's like active lobbying, like I know like, the, I believe, the cons I know the conservative network is right now very actively lobbying on this. When it comes to specifically the unrepatriated funds, I myself am not deep on this. I know when it comes to the New York State government, there, are, are, there have been at least some discussions about how you might be able to grab some of that revenue for the state government. And again, that actually, the, the New York State report is actually a good one. It's like 30 plus pages, and it actually tries to walk through all of the connections they see between state revenue base and what's happening at the federal level. So it gives sort of a nice walkthrough of how at least the New York state government is thinking about like the ways in which the changes will affect their tax base. There's one maybe question at the back. Okay. I think we're, yeah, we're unfortunately at time, but thanks so much for coming out and thanks to the panel.